How's everyone doing? It is 6.01 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 11-3-2017, I guess. I'm going to be continuing today with what I started yesterday. Uh, the video entitled, They're Hiding God and Not with a Globe. And everybody who listened to the video yesterday is aware that what I am perusing and attempting to uncover if there is in fact something to uncover and I believe there is and I believe that I've shown evidence for that thus far and will continue that the Hebrew scriptures as we know them have been very meticulously and cleverly altered when I say something like that the last thing I want is for anyone to get the uh, impression or idea that I believe because of this that we cannot know and understand es essential messages that were being given from the Hebrew Scriptures. Nor, nor do I believe that that is the case in the Greek. I believe that even with the efforts of those who have changed both uh, the Hebrew and the Greek, uh, or whatever language um, the New Testament was, was written in, Either way, I believe that because there's such a, a large body of work um, that compose both of those, it would be too difficult to change the essential messages that is being um, conveyed in them. So I. I don't want anybody to get the sense that we cannot trust the essential message that's there. I do believe we can. And uh, I've said this probably in, in one of my older videos, but um, it bears repeating. I would not, under virtually any circumstance, recommend the teachings of Chuck Missler. But, you know, uh, there's that old saying that a broken clock is right at least twice a day. He was, in one of his lectures or teachings, comparing the scriptures with what Missler knows about technology, which is vast and deep and his history of technology and military contracts should I think give people pause before they trust him but it's extensive and he knows quite a lot about technology and the way it works and what he was doing was he was making a comparison between the scriptures and a holographic image a holographic image is taken in three dimensions and the funny thing about a holographic image as he explains it and maybe I'll try to search for it at some point so I can uh, play it in one of my videos so you can get his comparison word for word which is far better than what I'm going to repeat here Be because of the way that a holographic image is composed what it's made up of he was explaining how if you detract or remove portions of it, it's virtually impossible to distort the image because of the way that all of the information contained therein works together to keep the entirety of the image intact enough to continue to recognize it even if someone were to detract from it or to distort portions of it and I think he's absolutely right and that's why 
I want to reassure anyone that I'm not trying to suggest in any way that, first off, that Yahweh hasn't preserved his word. He has. And I'm, I'm going to be a broken record when I repeat again and again the proverb that says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the honor of kings to search it out. Our Lord, Yahshua, he spoke mostly in parables. And he used a lot of apocalyptic dialogue uh, and monologues also. So you see, he was telling us plainly that the truth, it's not for everyone. That's, that's as, uh, that's as straightforward as I can be. Um, and Yahweh, our God, and Yahshua, our Lord, has, they have expressed that, that for those who want the truth, who want to know the truth, who have a true, deep desire for that truth, they're also going to have the desire uh, and the passion and the energy to search that truth out and there are rewards waiting for those who would would do such so believe me i i i don't in any way think that because the masoret scribes and others have attempted to change the word in a number of ways and they have that they have somehow entirely distorted the message concerning the character of Yahweh, uh, the essential history of uh, man and uh, Yahweh's people and inheritance, Israel, and Yahshua's ecclesia or congregation consisting of uh, non-Israelite and Israelite peoples alike. And that statement... I can and intend to prove at some later point. Before I begin, there is always groundwork to be laid if I'm going to try to fully express where I'm coming from, get ideas across to you. Oftentimes I have to express either caveats or disclaimers. I want you to be entirely informed before you listen to a lot of uh, theories or, or even solid factual information so you know where I'm coming from because if anyone comes to you and they say I have I have no biases I have no preconceived notions I have no worldview I'm working on I am a blank slate and I am working as a blank slate so all the information I present to you will be as um, unfettered by any kind of personal, subjective, worldview, philosophies, and so on, as possible. If anyone says that to you, uh, they're not telling the truth, because uh, I'm afraid that it's impossible. I don't see it as possible at all for somebody to do that. So I do want to give everybody a very good sense of where I'm coming from uh, and why I would do certain things, use certain terms. One of the things that you're going to find me doing a lot, and this is based on beliefs that I have thus far from my studies in this subject, you will often see me equating the ancient Hebrew characters to modern English letters. Because I believe that when you when you trim away the fat, you will see that English is by far one of the most, if not the most, Semitic languages that still exists today. But of course, we don't know that, and it would be very hard to prove. We have to just we have to look. At the characters then look at the letters 
and find what resemblance there is. So I'm putting that out there so that you understand I do have certain ideas, okay? And, and I don't want any of my ideas or theories to, to influence you in a way that might be um, unhelpful or negative in, in you doing your own studies. Uh, for those of you who um, these videos have sparked some kind of passion to start looking into this subject more, Yahweh bless you. May our Lord Yeshua keep you and, and move you on with, with great passion and vitality and vigor in this. But at the same time, I do hope that any of um, my own notions and theories and ideas don't hamper you getting further down the road. And that's why I am being very open with uh, my own beliefs, uh, my own opinions, my own theories about these things. I'm going to start out by reading you. This is just not a very long excerpt of uh, an email I sent somebody who had contacted me through the channel, uh, who I had spoken to for just um, a brief, brief time. And I, I haven't heard from this person uh, in at least a few weeks. Uh, I even sent them another email recently asking them if they were all right or if I had said anything um, that uh, had offended them or something because it was sad to not hear from them. They, they know enough about language and the languages that I'm working in to be uh, quite an asset. So uh, if they're listening, I, I hope they will. Uh, return my email if they aren't who they have said they are um, I do hope that God is merciful to you for your deceit but um, I am trusting that this person is who they say they are and if they're not then they're not so this is an excerpt that I wrote and I was trying to explain where I was coming from concerning the ancient Hebrew okay and I quote me, I believe one of the biggest barriers in our communication is that I am working from the theory that English, for whatever reason, is the closest language to ancient Hebrew, but it is very different from modern Hebrew. Modern English has 26 letters. Ancient Hebrew has 22 characters. Modern Hebrew has 27 letters if you count all the n forms of kaf mem nun pe and sadi 28 if the aleph slash lamed makes it in there and i know nothing about aleph slash lamed it ends up in many aleph bets though i digress anyway alike modern hebrew modern english has too many unnecessary repeats it's common knowledge that J was added to the English only four centuries ago. C isn't necessary, nor is X. Since either Z or KS already represents those sounds. When looking at earlier languages in the evolution of English, V and F need not be there at all, and Q by itself is a repeat of the K sound. When it comes to vowels, A, E, I, O, and U cover it, so you don't need W and Y. When you alleviate those unneeded letters from the English alphabet, funny name, Greek. Anyways, you end up with 18 letters. All you need to do is add back in the four characters that make a compound sound. These, I believe, are tsadi, which is T-S, kof, which is Q-U, qu, shin, which is sh, and tav, which is the T-H, th sound you'd get in bath or the. Now you have 22 English characters, same as Hebrew. Of course, most Hebrew scholars would say my evaluation is ludicrous. Maybe so. But they have no proof 
either way. If we trim the fat off either modern Hebrew or English, we end up with nearly the same alphabet. Now, look at the letters as pictographical characters, hieroglyphs, which are superior to letters, and the language becomes much easier. Our communications problems, you speaking modern Hebrew and me speaking modern English as first languages, is the amount of variance added over time. Just think of a modern hieroglyphic language you and I both understand very easily. Computer language. Icons. These are so easy to understand even my two-year-old knows what to look for on an iPhone or iPad. If we were all taught a language of icon, pictograph, hieroglyphic, I believe it would be so simple. I don't believe as many people in the past were as illiterate as we are made to believe. Because the further back one goes, the more sense the languages make. Look at ancient Hebrew without your modern Hebrew glasses on. Look at English the same way. You look at these two languages the way you do because you were taught them both phonetically, as was I. If you look at the, them the way I do, you don't need phonetics or phonics. You don't need an actual, in quotes, spelling class in school. Um, spelling as in spells. Really? If you boil English down, as I've just done, A, B, D, E, G, H, I, K, L, M, N, O, P, R, S, T, U, Z, and then T, S, Q U S H T H. You have ancient Hebrew. If we can then determine the real meanings of the characters, we can represent them in either language. For crying out loud, they even look the same. Now tell me, how does anyone need spelling lessons in either ancient Hebrew or modern, boiled down English? A is always A. E is always E, I is always E, O is always O, and U is U or U. This may not be a perfect equivalent of the five ancient Hebrew vowels, Aleph, He, Va, Yad, Ayin, but we're working closer and closer. A equals Aleph, E equals He, I equals Yad, O equals Ayin, U equals Wow. I say wow. Some people say vav. I say wow. Again, and I know it is currently problematic, is no one can prove me right or wrong. But let's stick with this for a moment. This, of course, deletes long and short vowel sounds in English and the nikod in modern Hebrew. You are a child who knows the 22 characters. Someone says, spell the word bread. Fine. B-R-E-D. The excess vowels and consonants are ridiculously arbitrary, since neither English nor modern Hebrew use icons. So, yes, if we look at the similarities between modern English and modern Hebrew through the glasses of our programmed phonetics, including homonyms, antonyms, and such, it's complex and confusing. I think, though, that English is one of the closest representations of ancient Hebrew, but of course, like modern Hebrew, with a lot of of extra baggage. So I, I hope that excerpt of um, an email of mine helps you understand where I'm coming from concerning the ancient Hebrew and the modern English. These are uh, ideas I have formulated over studying this for really only a few months now. And uh, I don't claim to be an expert at all in ancient Hebrew, 
uh, modern Hebrew, which is really Jewish Syriac. It's, uh, it's got a Syriac uh, Aramaic symbol. It's not Hebrew. Um, I don't claim to be a language expert at all. Um, I am looking at this and I am commenting on it. I am studying it for myself every morning right now, uh, studying extensively the Nikudot, which is uh, abundantly complex, folks. Uh, and um, uh, by the way, uh, when I'm finished with this, um, they're hiding God, but not with a globe series, which should just be uh, one and two, really just a two part. Uh, I may not make another video for, uh, I don't know, a little bit. Could be a few days, could be a week or two. I don't know because what I need to do is restock my information, uh, filter some things out, uh, come up with more points that I can offer you that will help you understand further what our current uh, situation is and help you get further down the road yourself. So I am going to pick up reading at the WordPress site. And I have an illustration ready for you real quick, too. Uh, this illustration is intended to help you understand where I'm coming from and that I'm not making these theories up. Uh, and much of this isn't theory. Um, and I, I hope this will really serve to give you a good idea of what the problem is with uh, what we know of today is as Hebrew, which is not, and how learning the ancient Hebrew and deciphering the complex Nikodot system, and then uh, thus uh, with the goal and intention of understanding what they're hiding in it, we can start to begin to understand the Bible fully as it was always intended for us to understand. So when I was going through and doing my listing of certain types of ancient Hebrew parent roots, I ran into a number of words as I went and made mental notes of them, words that I thought were very strange. Uh, if I took away the Nikudot and um, pronounced them just with their ancient Hebrew characters alone, um, you, you would have a hard time. Uh, understanding why it is that today we pronounce these words this way. And uh, the two words I have up on my screen are what we know today as David and Noah. Um, the, today, um, the Jewish Syriac, the, the Masoretic texts, uh, represent uh, the name of David as a, and I'm going to use the modern Jewish Syriac names for these characters. When I switch to ancient Hebrew, I'm, I use my own, I will not use modern Jewish Syriac names for the ancient Hebrew characters. Okay, so I do have sort of my own system for doing it, and it involves more uh, the sound that I believe it makes than actually giving them names, because I don't want to give them names yet. So David consists of a Dalit, a Wal, and a Dalit. Um, and David, as it is represented in the Masoretic point system, has three specific uh, symbols that come along with it, baggage. The first one down here under the first Dalit is called a Dagesh, or no, in the middle of the Dalit, I'm sorry, that is the Dagesh lean. Okay, it's a, it's an accent mark. Um, underneath it, this symbol here is called a kametz, and uh, it tells you to put an ah sound in between these first two letters. Underneath the wow is called a chirek, and it tells you to put an e sound in between uh, these two characters. Okay, so that when you pronounce it out, you would see the d, a, ah, the, e, d. But if you look at the character alone and you pronounce just the characters alone, your pronunciation would have to be dude. And uh, I doubt David's name was dude. 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 I don't think that's the case. Now, here is how I know that the explanation 
that the Masoretes simply standardized what was handed down as tradition from all the ages. Okay, this is how I know. Because uh, the presupposition is that they knew that this word here that was represented just by these three letters, without these, see, they added in all this stuff. The presupposition is that they knew that an ah sound should go here before the wa, okay? And they knew that an e sound should go here after the wa. Now, if you check uh, all various words, represented by the Masoretes these days, you will see that it's not that every time you see a Dalit, it's followed by an ah sound. That's not the case. It's not the case that every time you see a wow, that it's followed by an e sound. That's not the case. But they knew that there had to be an e sound after this and an a sound after this. Thus, I'm telling you right now that in some way they were working from text that had vowels in it. And I don't have to prove that as some kind of theory. We already saw it in that small portion of the Isaiah scroll that Jeff Benner compared on um, his ancient Hebrew website. Remember that last time? He showed us that they removed vowel sounds. And when I say vowel sounds, uh, that is coming from my belief that the ancient Hebrew had vowels. Those vowels would consist of, and I'm using the modern Jewish Syriac names here, folks, okay? It would consist of Aleph, Wow, Yod, Ayin, He. Those, I believe, are vowels. And I believe they are A, U, E, O, E. Now, because we have seen them remove mostly vowels, and how they try to convince us these days that even when we see these vowels represented, they are either consonantal sounds or inconsequential. We can see that in the word uh, Mashiach. In uh, Mashiach, uh, they put a furtive petak. Uh, it's a, another one of their Masoretic uh, complications. Underneath an ayin. And, of course, they completely um, act as if the ayin like we've been taught with modern English letters, they act like the I-N means nothing. And that what we should only pay attention to is their furtive petak, their uh, dots and dashes, their symbols, the way that they're hiding the text of the Bible. So what I'm saying is, based on real evidence, we have that they were moving, re removing characters, then it's safe to say that it's highly possible, and I'm going to write this using the Jewish Syriac uh, characters below, okay? Um, it is highly possible that the way that this was originally represented was as this. Da u eed. Da -u -eed. Now, maybe this wasn't here. The Aleph, that is. Um, because it has been shown by those who study um, Paleo Hebrew, it's quite similar to ancient Hebrew, that oftentimes the Ah or Aleph was uh, that sound, just the sound, Ah, uh, would be used as a default between uh, consonants that had no vowel represented. Of course, this is one of the things that we're going to have to determine in the 
uh, study of how these things were hidden. So then it is possible to believe that maybe the name of Dawid was written that way. Again, I'm using modern Jewish Syriac. If I was to use the uh, ancient Hebrew, it would be like this. And there are a few sites out there, by the way, who have uh, definitions of what they believe that these characters mean. I would be very careful with um, trusting too much uh, their assessment of what the meanings of these characters are. I think that that is also going to take careful study. And more than that, more than that, the leading and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So that's it in the ancient character. Now up here, we have the name Noah. That's interesting because all I see is a nun and a chet. And I hate even saying its name because I don't believe there's any gutturals in the ancient Hebrew. So if you were to only take these characters and try to pronounce them in the ancient Hebrew, all you would get is basically na. And yes, I believe that this is only an H sound, which would have a breath at the end. I don't believe that this character is here to necessarily provide pronunciation. I believe it is more here to provide understanding of what his name means. It, it's like the silent letters in English. Everybody who's been taught phonetics uh, in, in phonics in English, uh, if you went back to the kindergarten, the first grade, second grade classes where you were being indoctrinated with phonics in English, you would know, and some of you might still remember how you felt about and thought about these, these stupid things that they made you do in English, like all of these silent letters. Well, if it's a silent letter, why is it there? If it's not bringing intrinsic meaning to the word, it doesn't belong in the word. And I believe that's the case here. This character has meaning because it's a character, not a letter. That's why it's here. So anyways, if you were to pronounce this with the ancient Hebrew, all you would get out of it is na. But the Masoretes came along, and since, as their story goes, they were just standardizing the traditions of pronunciation of the Hebrew, they somehow knew that it needed this dot here over the nun, which is called a kolem, and this little dash underneath the chet, which is called a furtive petak. Uh, this dot up here tells you to pronounce an O sound, and this furtive petak tells you to pronounce an A sound before uh, this last character here. And I hate saying its modern Jewish Syriac name, as I'm afraid that the phlegm in my lungs from the upper respiratory infection is going to start moving on me, and I'm going to have to pause the video again. Anyways... So that's why they can say this is supposed to be no ah. You see? Now, if you go and check the nuns all over in the Hebrew scriptures, you'll find that there's absolutely nothing that tells you that every time you see a nun or a nun before um, a, oh my gosh, chet, I'm going to start just calling it chet. That's the modern Jewish Syriac name for it, chet like my buddy Chet, you would find that there's no patterns per se that would ever tell you that uh, this O sound should come before this uh, furtive petak under the Chet. What I'm getting at is, I believe they knew that there were already these symbols present. And because they developed a system to hide symbols, I'm not saying that they were like, um, oh yeah, the name Noah. We, we need to take away two characters from the name Noah. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, 
as part of the system they developed to hide the scriptures. It necessitated that they take away either one or two characters from this name, you see. And I'm not sure if I believe that this would just be a Nun, Ayin, and Chet. Um, because it has those sounds. But it's going to have to be one thing or another. Okay? It's either going to have to be, and I'm going to use the ancient Hebrew character here. There. There. Boy, is it hard to draw with a mouse. Okay, there. And there. That's the ancient Hebrew character, okay? No. Ah. And that's there for a good reason, because that's going to tell us something about what his name means. Now, unfortunately, I can't tell you what all these characters means yet. But I can tell you I've studied them enough to affirm that they all have their own meaning. And more than that, I do believe that they all relate to each other in very certain specific ways. Um, I believe that there are certain characters that are active and certain characters that are passive. And we need to divide between those two to begin to understand the way that they link um, certain other characters and make them work with one another to give us solid, concrete meanings to words. Okay? Like, for instance, this here, the ancient Hebrew, um, it's called a yod, okay? Or yod. That's active. Everything I've ever seen it in or its context or, or some meanings that I'm able to derive um, tells me that it's active. This right here, that's usually called Vav or Wa, I believe that that is quite possibly active. And I believe that this, Vav or Wa, it's so called, actually has a very, very special relationship between other characters when it's represented in the middle of the two, like we see it here. Okay? Although, as I've pointed out, if the Nikudot is hiding this Yad here, then this so-called Vav may actually just be representing a relationship between the so-called Dalit and the so-called Yad. I hope I've illustrated to you that there not only is uh, problems with the Nikudot, but the fact that they had to be using this Nicodote system to hide extra characters that should be there. Not letters, extra characters that should be there. So that we don't have to go and refer to whatever nonsense these rabbis have told us about. Okay? Or we don't have to go to Strong's and get their definitions. We can look at this stuff and we can know very clearly, very sharply. We can look at something like these characters here and know what this means and why. You see, when you go to Strong, they're going to tell you that um, they're going to tell you that David means beloved. Sure. Well, how did they come to that conclusion? There's inherent meaning in these characters. We have to drop the symbols, drop the letters. A letter is something I write to somebody. They're characters. They're icons. Hieroglyphics, if you will. All right, so back on to, to this WordPress uh, article I was reading from because this is just absolutely brilliant. It's beautiful. And um, 
I had stopped off with uh, when he started going through the, the specifics. And I will pick up there, of course. Um, we had gone past that little bit of the psalm. Uh, we had seen in uh, the Isaiah uh, text the way that they had. Okay. We're going to pick up right here after the psalm where they left out the entire nun verse, the acrostic psalm 145. Check your versions of the Bible. You'll see that most versions leave that out, which is just nuts. Septuagint does not. Septuagint has it in there. A couple of English versions, popular English versions have it in there. Ask yourself this too. Why is it that most popular uh, English versions of the Bible that all these software makers, uh, all of these free sites like Bible Hub and Blue Letter Bible and uh, Bible Study Tools, eSword, all of that, why are they mostly pushing Bible texts based on the Masoretic? Uh, you should ask yourself. He goes on, yet the Septuagint, which is uh, represented by uh, a Roman numeral LXX for 70, Greek translation of the Old Testament does include the missing verse. And when that verse is translated back into Hebrew, it starts with the Hebrew letter Nun, which was missing from the Masoretic text. In the early 20th century, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in caves near Qumran they say. They revealed an ancient Hebrew textual tradition which differed from the tradition preserved by the Masoretes. Written in Hebrew, copies of Psalm 145 were found which included the missing verse. And then he shows that example again. Okay, the missing verse reads, quote, the Lord is faithful in his words and holy in his works. This verse can be found in the Orthodox Study Bible, which relies on the Septuagint. But this verse is absent from the King James Version, the New King James Version, the Complete Jewish Bible, and every other translation which is based on the Masoretic Text. In this particular case, it is easy to demonstrate that the Masoretic Text is in error, for it is obvious that Psalm 145 was originally written in an acrostic psalm, but what are we to make of the thousands of other locations where the Masoretic text diverges from the Septuagint? If the Masoretic text could completely erase an entire verse from one of the Psalms, how many other passages of Scripture have been edited? How many other verses have been erased? A radically different alphabet is the next section. If Moses were to see a copy, of the Masoretic text, he wouldn't be able to read it, and that's absolutely correct. As discussed in this recent post, the original Old Testament scriptures were written in Paleo-Hebrew, a text closely related to the ancient Phoenician writing system. And oftentimes, um, when people say Paleo-Hebrew, uh, they mean an alphabet that is, is very, very, very similar to ancient Hebrew. Okay, there's a number of variants um, that have been found that are just very old versions of either ancient Hebrew or Phoenician, which were virtually the same with just some differences in how they wrote their character. The Masoretic text is written with an alphabet which was borrowed from Assyria or Persia around the 6th to 7th century BC and is almost a thousand years newer than the form of writing used by Moses, David, and most of the Old Testament authors. Correct. Now, the next subpoint: adding vowel points. For thousands of years, ancient Hebrew was only written with consonants, no vowels. This is his assumption, by the way, folks. He hasn't gotten as far down the road um, as I, and that's not an insult. That's just... Uh, he's... He's looked at other things than me, okay? When reading these texts, they had to supply all the vowels from memory based on oral tradition. And what he's pulling from is basically the, uh, the status quo understanding of what the Masoretes did, okay? He's just, he's just repeating what they say they did. 
In Hebrew, just like modern languages, vowels can make a big difference. The change of a single vowel can radically change the meaning of a word. An example in English is the difference between slap and slip. These words have different definitions. Yet if our language was written without vowels, both of these words would be written SLP. Thus the vowels are very important. The most extensive change the Masoretes brought to the Hebrew text was the addition of vowel points. In an attempt to solidify for all time the, in quotes, correct readings of all the Hebrew scriptures, the Masoretes added a series of dots to the text identifying which vowel to use in any given location. Now, I, and everything I've explained to you in the last video and the beginning of this video is diametrically opposed to that narrative that that's what they were doing, was standardizing pronunciations based on a tradition of vowel uh, pronouncements. I believe that that is utter uh, manure. But he goes on to say, Adam Clark, an 18th century Protestant scholar, demonstrates that the vowel point system is actually a running commentary, which was incorporated into the text itself. In the general preface of his biblical commentary published in 1810, Clark writes, Quote, the Masoretes, which the most extensive Jewish commentators, which that nation ever could boast. I'm sorry, the Masoretes were the most extensive Jewish commentators, which that nation could ever boast. The system of punctuation, probably invented by them, is a continual gloss on the law and the prophets. Their vowel points and prosaic and metrical accents give every word to which they are affixed a peculiar kind of meaning, which in their simple state, multitudes of them can by no means bear. The vowel points alone add whole conjugations to the language, you see. This system is one of the most artificial, particular, and extensive comments ever written on the Word of God, for there is not one word in the Bible that is not the subject of a particular gloss through its influence. Can you pick up what Adam Clark is putting down? That's some serious stuff there, man. How people ignored that. I know how people ignored that. They still ignore it today. 1810, he wrote that. Another early scholar who invented, investigated this matter was Louis Capel, who wrote during the early 17th century an article in the 1948 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. It includes the following information regarding his research of the Masoretic text. Interesting year there, 1948. A year after, they say the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in a cave in Qumran by a uh, simple Bedouin shepherd boy who had brought his flock of goats down to the most miserable place in the world to find good fertile ground for them to feed. Anyways, quote, as a Hebrew scholar, he concluded that the vowel points and accents were not an original part of Hebrew, but were inserted by the Masoretic Jews of Tiberias not earlier than the 5th century AD, and that the primitive Hebrew characters are Aramaic and were substituted for the more ancient at the time of the captivity. The various readings in the Old Testament text and the differences between the ancient versions and the Masoretic text convinced him that the integrity of the Hebrew text as held by Protestants was untenable. And if you didn't understand that, what he was saying was that he believes many of the scribes changed the ancient and paleo Hebrew character into letters that closely resembled Aramaic, or at any rate, certainly were not representing what the characters, the pictographical characters were representing. So 
this idea that Protestants believe that um, the Masoretes, their scribes, their, their textual proclivities are in any way correct. It's just not a debate one could ever hope to win. Now, this man continues, Many Protestants love the Masoretic text, believing it to be a trustworthy representation of the original Hebrew text of Scripture. And yet, at the same time, most Protestants reject Orthodox Church tradition as being untrustworthy. They believe that the Church's oral tradition could not possibly preserve truth over a long period of time. Right? Therefore, the vowel points of the Masoretic text put Protestants in a precarious position. If they believe that the Masoretic vowels are not trustworthy, then they call the Masoretic text itself into question. But if they believe the Masoretic vowels are trustworthy, then they are forced to believe that the Jews successfully preserved the vowels of Scripture for thousands of years through oral tradition alone until the Masoretes finally invented the vowel points hundreds of years after Christ. Either conclusion is at odds with mainstream Protestant thought. It sure is. It sure is. Either oral tradition can be trusted or it can't. If it can be trusted, then there is no reason to reject the traditions of the Orthodox Church, which have been preserved for nearly 2,000 years. But if traditions are always untrustworthy, then the Masoretic vowel points are also untrustworthy and should be rejected. It's amazing because uh, the Masoretes admit that these, this point system is based on their oral tradition. And if anyone pays any attention to the New Testament, they would understand that that, that whole mindset, that whole mindset was the evil mindset that Yahshua railed against throughout his whole ministry. That mindset was the precursor that led up to the uh, solidifying of all of their evil ideas over time in the Babylonian Talmud. I mean, not only is oral tradition to not necessarily be trusted, even as this guy points out, right? Even in the Orthodox Church, how much would we trust the oral tradition of those people who screamed, let his blood be on us and our children? Okay, the next point he goes into is excluding books of Scripture from the Old Testament. Now this, a lot of you are going to find very interesting. The Masoretic text promotes a canon of the Old Testament which is significantly shorter than the canon represented by the Septuagint. Meanwhile, Orthodox Christians and Catholics have Bibles which incorporate the canon of the Septuagint. The books of Scripture found in the Septuagint but not found in the Masoretic text are commonly called either the Deuterocanon or the Anagnoscomena. Anagnoscomena. That is quite a word right there. While it is outside the scope of this article to perform an in-depth study of the canon of Scripture, a few points relevant to the Masoretic text should be made here. Point 1. With the exception of two books, the Deuterocanon was originally written in Hebrew. Point 2. In three places, the Talmud explicitly refers to the book of Sirach as Scripture. <laughs> You see, these guys, they cannot keep their dirty deeds completely secret. They always slip up and give away their hand. Point three, Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, a feast which originates in the book of 1 Maccabees and nowhere else in the Old Testament. And you guys, you will find that in at least one of the Gospels where it says that he was up in Jerusalem for the Feast of Dedication. That's another name for, I guess, what they call Hanukkah, all right? And it is. It's recorded in 2 Maccabees. That's, then that's, that's why they, be, they, uh, they started and kept that, um, that Feast of Dedication. Anyways, unless I'm wrong. Hey, if somebody knows that I'm completely wrong, 
and the Feast of Dedication should be um, um, equivalent with something else, let me know in the comments. The Book of Wisdom includes a striking prophecy of Christ, and its fulfillment is recorded in Matthew 27. And it does. The Book Wisdom, or Wisdom of Solomon, striking prophecy of Christ. It's amazing, really. Point, whatever. Another point. <laughs> Numerous findings among the Dead Sea Scrolls suggest the existence of first century Jewish communities which accepted many of the deuterocanonical books as authentic scripture. Okay. Another point. Many thousands of first century Christians were converts from Judaism. Although I don't know that it was called Judaism, um, I suppose the teachings of the Pharisees and scribes and whatnot, um, yeah, they rejected that and, and repented. And uh, that's the thing. It, it's a, it, you know, a lot of this stuff um, is 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 on the foundation or the belief that Judaism that Judaism has really much of anything to do with uh, the writings of Moses and the prophets and and all that. It doesn't. It was their traditions, and uh, it, it just got worse. The early church accepted the inspiration of the Deuterocanon and frequently quoted authoritatively from books such as Wisdom. Sirach and Tobit. This early Christian practice suggests that many Jews accepted these books even prior to their conversion to Christianity. That's interesting. I'm sorry. I'm going to go up here for a sec. <laughs> what did he just say? Um, okay. Well, you guys can see. Um, um, certain uh, versions of uh, the Septuagint, they do include a number of books. Uh, do all of them belong? I don't know. Do all the books in the accepted canon belong? Huh. There's debate. There's debate, man. Okay. Uh, a friend of mine brought this up to me that, that uh, certain people have argued against the book of Esther as, as belonging in the canon of Scripture. And that's funny that he did, too, because, you know, I've, I've noticed ever since I've realized the underlying um, text, the Hebrew text, and how many times the actual name uh, Yahweh uh, appears 6,883 times in um, the Hebrew scriptures. It doesn't, it does not appear once in the book of Esther, not once. And they, uh, the book of, of Esther is the most loved book in uh, the so-called Old Testament by uh, Talmudic Jews today. Ah, they love that book. They love Purim. Purim's like, uh, like their version of Halloween, you know? Um, it's shady. Uh, look into it. Uh, the last point is Ethiopian Jews preserve the ancient Jewish acceptance of the Septuagint, including much of its canon of scripture. Sirach, Judith, Baruch, and Tobit are among the books included in the canon of the Ethiopian Jews. That's really interesting about the Ethiopian Jews. If you can do some digging and find their artwork, um, they'll show you um, that, that they have very, very old artwork that shows um, Jesus, Yahshua, and, and the apostles, the early apostles, as all being white folks, um, Caucasians. It's interesting. Um, and then his section on changes to prophecy and doctrine. He says, when compiling any given passage of scripture, the Masoretes had to choose among multiple versions of the ancient Hebrew texts. Uh, in some cases, the textual differences were relatively inconsequential. For example, two texts may differ over the spelling of a person's name. Okay, that's what he says. They they had multiple versions to choose from, and they always chose the version which um, de-emphasized messianic prophecies. That's possible, right? Uh, my theory is um, uh, there was a number of them that they just plain chose to, to change because... Um, because, specifically, they were messianic prophecy passages. But either way, either way, they, they hated Yahshua then. Um, the modern uh, rabbis and scribes and, and all, they hate him today. So um, don't trust any of them. That's a good rule of thumb. However, in other cases, they were presented with textual variants which made a considerable impact upon doctrine or prophecy. In cases like these, were the Masoretes completely objective, or did their anti-Christian biases influence any of their editing decisions? 
Um, yeah. He, you read the Talmud. If you're not familiar with the Talmud, you read the Talmud. You see what it teaches. And, and the fact that, that, that every um, person that calls themselves a Jew, Orthodox Jew, or practices Judaism, has to confirm that that is their main book of teachings that they defer to, and their hearts are darkened beyond belief. Okay, that's who we're talking about. That's who came up with this point system, implemented this point system, and made these changes. It's people with hearts as black as night. In the second century AD, hundreds of years before the time of the Masoretes, Justin Martyr investigated a number of Old Testament texts in various Jewish synagogues. He ultimately concluded that the Jews who had rejected Christ had also rejected the Septuagint and were now tampering with the Hebrew scriptures themselves. Yeah. Uh, here's the quote. But I am far from putting reliance in your teachers who refuse to admit that the interpretation made by the 70 elders who were with Ptolemy, the king of the Egyptians, is a correct one. And they attempt to frame another, and I wish you to observe that they have altogether taken away many scriptures from the Septuagint translations affected by those 70 elders who were with Ptolemy, and by which this very man who was crucified is proved to have been set forth expressly as God and man, and as being crucified, and as dying. And that was uh, said to be 150 A.D. Justin Martyr, yeah, Dialogue with Trypho the Jew. Yeah, that's an interesting work, Dialogue with Trypho. He goes on to say, if Justin Martyr's findings are correct, then it's likely that the Masoretes inherited a Hebrew textual tradition which had already been corrupted with an anti-Christian bias. If we look at some of the most significant differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text, that is precisely what we see, for example, considering the follow consider the following comparisons and then he has a chart I'm not going to go through all of these comparisons I, I will copy paste this address uh, into the description uh, of this video so that you can go ahead and look at it and he says these are not random inconsequential differences between the texts and they're not they are clear changes to messianic prophecy texts Rather, these appear to be places where the Masoretes or their forebears had varied selection of texts to consider, and their decisions were influenced by anti-Christian bias. Yep, he's, he's right. Um, he goes on to say, um, it would seem the Septuagint translation is not only far more ancient than the Masoretic text, that the uh, Septuagint is far more accurate as well. It is a more faithful representation of the original Hebrew scriptures. And that may well be too. Okay. Um, I have uh, Breton's Septuagint on, uh, on Esword. And I think there's one other variant of the Septuagint that you can find in, you know, like Bible Hub or something like that. But um, so there's a couple of different Septuagints out there. And there's a lot of argument, by the way, on Septuagints too. <laughs> Imagine that. Go figure. You know, always. Always these arguments, always these arguments. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with arguments. I mean, truth is the truth. You know, you got to argue for the truth. Um, th this, is, this is what I think is going on so far. I think it has been aptly illustrated by myself, by others, that the Masoretes have removed vital characters which lend to the complete understanding of the Word of God. I believe myself and others have already demonstrated that if we were to learn the Hebrew in its character form and to determine objectively, come up with some way to determine objectively the meaning of these characters, then we can begin to very, very much understand the meanings of words phrases, books, all of that in a better, more accurate way. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you can't understand the Bible. I'm saying it would give us far more insight into many very, very important subjects. Subjects that dictate doctrine. 
people build doctrine on, theological constructs, a worldview on. So this is important to do. Now, is the Septuagint more accurate than the Masoretic? It certainly does appear so. And I'll tell you something else, folks. If you have the drive, the passion, and the gumption to start working on these things, start figuring these things out, because it needs to be done for the sake, for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ. It needs to be done for the sake of the glory of Yahweh God and his Messiah. It needs to be done for the sake of the edification of the saints. It needs to be done for the sake of your children, your grandchildren, generations to come and the ages to come. It needs to be done for the sake of the fact that the enemy wants to only steal, kill, and destroy, and we are to be the keepers of the light, of reflecting the light of Christ himself. It needs to be done. So, I'm saying that should you have the passion to begin doing these things, um, anybody may contact me. You can begin by just, you know, sending me a message or something and tell me that you're serious about working on things. And if that be the case, then it's really going to have to be, you know, I can tell you uh, as I go what things that I need um, people to look into, you know, and and you're going to have to do that. I, you know, I, I don't get on to people when they don't do something. If they if they offer me help, they say, I'm here to help. And um, I, I tell them what they could do to be helpful. If they just choose not to do it or they choose to do their own thing or not do what I've asked, I, I don't get on to people. I just stop asking for their help and then and then have a nice day, you know, take care. Maybe this wasn't for you. Maybe something else is for you, you know, because that happens. Sometimes we... Uh, think we have a passion for something and, and then we find out we don't. I understand. But you could help. Uh, you, you can do this independently. You don't, you don't need me. You don't need me. You, you need the Holy Spirit and, and that passion and drive that uh, only the living God and the spirit of his son can give you. That's what you need. Um, I'd be glad to to work with those people who are willing to work, who are willing to do some work, because this is not, this is not play. This is probably going to involve a lot of work, but it's worth it. It's going to be worth it. In the end, it's going to yield great, great, great rewards. Um, but no matter what, you, you work on it on your own or with me, that's fine. But, um, I'm telling you, the tools the, the tools do currently exist in different softwares that will allow serious students to not only start determining um, how the, uh, the Masoretes have tried to hide um, aspects of the Hebrew scriptures, but the tools also exist where one can take the Septuagint, and uh, far more proper translations and wordings and wording orders uh, of those translations they did, which I'm not sure everything about their translations were uh, true to the Hebrew text, but at least the form of their translations were. You see where I'm going with that? There exists software where um, equivalent, equivalent texts in the Hebrew can be derived from what we know about the Septuagint. Folks, this is doable. It's doable. And you don't have to have, you know, a PhD in BS to do this stuff. We've got far too many people out there that are trying to teach us stuff that's nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Like this page here. This page here that... Uh, uh, is is praising um, uh, the Masoretes and their text and their vowel point system and, you know, just cheerleading for them. And they say right here in, in, in point, uh, 2.2, the vocalization, they say one of the important projects of the Masoretes was uh, the invention of vowel marks for the Hebrew language. Hebrew writing is mainly consonantal. Auxiliary letters, Aleph, Vav, and Yod are occasionally used to indicate the vowel sound, but they can uh, only can be used for some of the vowels. And those vowels cannot be indicated ambiguously by the 
auxiliary letters. Thus, for example, the word, it's Dabar. Now, check this out, folks. Can read Davar thing, Diber, he said, Dubar, it was said, Diver, plague, and so on. Even when an auxiliary vav is added, as in, it would be like Dubar, okay. Anyways, it's a, a Dalit vav, B, Bet, Resh. Uh, this can be read as uh, Dubar, it was said, Dover, a speaker, and Dover, a stall. Because of the sanctity of the Bible, it was not permitted to add or remove letters. <laughs> right. And that's the assumption that they preserve the sanctity of the Bible. But you see the problem there? You see how many variants, how many different things that those three characters could be, depending on what the Masoretes decided to put in point-wise? This is a great mystery to be unraveled and solved. And uh, I'm, I'm smiling right now. Because I know that it's going to yield fruit again and again and again. It's going to yield so much fruit. I can't think of a, of a better um, course of study. I can't. And this is what I'm going to be focusing on. As I said, anyone who wishes to help, um, you can contact me through various means. That's great. And... Um, I can tell you things that that would be good to do if you want to to get going on this. Um, and if if you keep up, that'll be great. You know, we could probably work together and maybe accomplish good things. Uh, we will accomplish good things if you're uh, willing and sincere, filled with the Holy Spirit. Then we're going to accomplish good things. If you fizzle out, you know, um, it happens. It happens to the best of us. You know, but. Um, Know this, the enemy can't win. And remember what Yahshua said to the church in Philadelphia. He said, I have the keys of David, not dude, David. He says, I open and no one can shut. I shut and no one can open. Behold, I have placed before you an open door. I do hope that whatever way uh, it manifests itself in, in your life, that all of us choose to go through that door and find the things that are findable, to be honorable as kings and search out the mysteries that it is the prerogative and glory of Yahweh to conceal. So uh, that's all I have to say about that for now. And... Uh, until next time, I hope all of you are greatly blessed. I truly do. And, uh, oh, gosh, I guess that's it. So, as always, my exhortation, please do continue to love the truth. It will love you back. Take care.